Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Lyme Disease, Molecular Diagnostics, and Detection of New Causative Agents, presented by Dr. Bobby Pritt. I'm Susie Valdez of LabRoots, and I will be your moderator for today's event. We are excited to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots, the leading scientific social networking website and provider of virtual events and webinars advancing scientific collaboration and learning. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone for this, that this presentation is interactive. We want to hear from you. So questions, comments, and even answers can be submitted via the green Q&A button at the lower left of your screen. We'll try to get to everyone, but if not, we will make sure to follow up with you by email. You can also enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of your slide window. If you cannot hear or see this presentation properly, let us know by clicking on the support button at the top right or the Q&A button at the lower left. This is an educational webinar and thus offers free continuing education credits. After the webinar is over, please click on the CE button located on the bottom left-hand corner of your webpage and follow the process of obtaining your credits. I'd now like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Bobby Pritt. Dr. Pritt is a professor of laboratory medicine and pathology at the Mayo Clinic, where she serves as the co-director of the Vector Borne Diseases Laboratory Services. She's received her medical degree from the Robert Larner College of Medicine at the University of Vermont and completed residency training in pathology, followed by a fellowship in clinical microbiology. She has been in practice for almost 10 years and is one of 175 doctors at the Mayo Clinic who specialize in pathology. I'd now like to turn the presentation over to Dr. Pritt. Welcome. Thank you, Susie, for that kind introduction. So as Susie mentioned, I'm going to be discussing Lyme disease today, focusing on molecular diagnostics and what is available and how they can be used for diagnosis of Lyme disease in conjunction with other tests testing. And then I'm also going to touch on how they can be used for detecting new causative agents, an area that I think is particularly exciting. Now, before we begin, I'll just say that my only disclosure is I am employed by Mayo Clinic. We offer some of the tests that I will be mentioning today for our detection of Lyme disease. So the overview of my talk is shown here on this slide. I'm going to start by reviewing Lyme disease so that we're all on the same page in terms of Lyme disease epidemiology and clinical presentation. I'm then going to overview the testing methodologies that uh, are commonly used, including serology, which is really our gold standard at this time. But then I'm going to get into molecular techniques, touch on what is in our future for new molecular approaches, and then I'm going to finish by a case study uh, where we used molecular diagnostics for detection of a new organism that causes Lyme disease. So let's talk about Lyme disease specifically. It is caused by bacteria that are transmitted by ticks. These bacteria are spirochetes, and I've shown these spiral-shaped organisms here on the upper right-hand corner of the screen. So this is what they look like, although they're microscopic and can't be seen with the naked eye. And they are in this large complex called Borrelia burgdorferi sensu latu complex. It's a bit of a mouthful, it's a long name, and it's a group of organisms that are closely related, and many of them are capable of causing Lyme disease. In the United States, Borrelia burgdorferi sensu strictu is the main cause of Lyme disease. And going forward, for simplicity, I'm just going to call this Borrelia burgdorferi. So this is the main cause of Lyme disease in the United States. But there are others, Borrelia afzelii, Borrelia guarinii, and Borrelia burgdorferi cause Lyme disease in Europe. And some of these species cause Lyme disease in parts of Asia as well. Now, Looking at a bigger picture, I should mention that the Borrelia species are even more diverse than just the Sensu Latu complex. In fact, there is a large group called relapsing fever Borrelia species, but I'm only going to be discussing the Borrelia burgdorferi Sensu Latu complex today. These are the species that include agents of Lyme disease. I won't be getting into the relapsing fever Borrelia that include Borrelia miyamotoi, which some of you may have heard of. It's been in the news recently. And because this is a test about uh, a talk about molecular diagnostics, I also want to give you a little basic background about Borrelia burgdorferi. 
Its genome size is shown here, about 1,500,000 base pairs. And it's interesting in that it has a linear chromosome and it also has plasmids. The linear chromosome has a GC content of 28.6% and then it has 21 plasmids of which 9 are circular and 12 are linear. So all combined, the linear chromosome and the plasmids carry about 860 genes. Now let's talk about the epidemiology of Lyme disease. This is an important disease that many of you are probably familiar with. It is the most common vector-borne illness in the United States and Europe. So anything transmitted by a vector that would include insects, um, such as mosquitoes and ticks, of all of those diseases, Lyme is the most common. Now, it was first described in the United States in 1975, associated with what was thought at the time as a cluster of juvenile rheumatoid arthritis cases. Well, it turns out that they weren't juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. They were instead infection with Lyme disease. Now, Lyme does not occur nationwide. In fact, it's concentrated in certain areas specifically in the northeast and the upper midwestern parts of the United States. And you can see that on the map here on the bottom right, where the darker colors show the states that have more cases of Lyme disease. It's also spreading up into Canada, even though that's not shown on this map. And it became a nationally notifiable disease in 1990. So we've been able to track the number of Lyme disease cases because they're reported to the, uh, the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, every year. And so we have some good data, and I'm going to show you some of that here. On this map, on this slide, it's showing the reported cases of Lyme disease starting in 2001. So every blue dot on this map represents a reported case of Lyme disease, and the dot is just placed randomly within a county from where that case was reported. So now, look and see as we scan through different years, 2001, 2002, and as we continue through, note that the blue dots are increasing in number and expanding their range. So now up to 2012, you can see that there's an extensive portion of the upper northeast that has a lot of blue dots and the upper Midwest, especially in Minnesota and Wisconsin. And from the data that we have, there are more than 30,000 cases reported each year to the CDC, but studies have shown that the actual estimates are probably closer to 300,000 cases each year. And I've provided the references for you on the bottom of the screen. So this is based on data we have from reference laboratories and also physician offices. Now the vector for this bacterium is the black-legged tick. And the main vector is Ixodi scapularis, found throughout much of the United States. Uh, on the west coast, it's the western black-legged tick, Ixodes pacificus. This tick is relatively small compared to some of the other ticks you may have seen, such as the dog tick. Here are a number of ticks, different life cycle stages of the black-legged tick, shown beside a dime. But I thought even for a better representation, I would use this example of a bagel. So we're all familiar with the everything bagel, with sesame seeds, sunflower seeds, well, or, and, uh, and poppy seeds, I mean. And so the sesame seeds, like this one here, that's about the size of an adult black-legged tick. So that's an adult. That's as big as it gets until it starts feeding on blood. And that's what is going to potentially be on you and what you'd want to keep an eye out for. Now, the nymphal stage, which can also transmit the agent that causes Lyme disease, is about the size of a poppy seed, so even smaller. So you can see how these would be very difficult to detect, especially before they start feeding on blood and get bigger. Now, the life cycle of Ixodes scapularis is shown here. This is from the CDC. And it's a two-year life cycle. It's pretty complex, and it goes through multiple stages, the larvae, nymph, and adult stages, and each stage has to take a blood meal. A blood meal 
uh, is a way just to say it feeds on another host, it takes blood, and then it uses that blood to molt into the next stage. So let's start with the eggs, as circled here in red. So the eggs are laid in the spring by the female, and this female has overwintered, essentially hibernated under the leaf litter and has stayed alive throughout the winter, even in our cold Minnesota and northeastern winters, and survived to come out and lay eggs. These eggs will hatch into larvae in the summer. And these larvae are very small. They usually feed on small animals, such as birds and rodents. Those birds and rodents may be infected with Lyme disease. So at this point, that larva can now become infected with Lyme disease itself. The larva will now molt into a nymph, but that won't happen until it's overwintered. So we are now in April, and the nymphal stages are just starting to come out after a long winter's hibernation, and they are potentially infected with Lyme disease. They are now going to be searching for their next blood meal, and that could be on a larger animal, could be a deer, could be a human. And at this point, they can transmit Borrelia burgdorferi to that human when they feed. So this is actually the highest uh, area of risk for human infection, the late spring and the summer, because these nymphs are very small, the size of a poppy seed, and they are out looking for a blood male, and they can bite us and transmit, and we can get Lyme disease. Now, they will then take their blood meal and turn into adults. That's the final stage. And these adults in the fall will also be out looking for a blood meal. And so we often see a second peak of tick-borne diseases in the fall, especially for things such as anaplasmosis, because these adults, also potentially infected and capable of transmitting Lyme disease, are also out now biting humans. They will overwinter, and they lay their eggs, and the life cycle continues. Now, when these different stages of ticks take a bite and they start pumping their blood full of, or their body full of blood, they become engorged. So this picture here shows how on the left-hand side, there is an adult tick about the size of a sesame seed that is not engorged, but the middle tick is partially engorged, and the, on the right-hand side, this is a fully engorged adult tick. It's the same tick, it's just gotten significantly bigger because it's now full of blood. And now the image above is showing a full tick, full of blood, who is pregnant and she's laying her eggs. So this is happening right about now. These ticks are coming out from under the leaf litter, litter after overwintering. So who is at risk for infection? Well, essentially anyone who's going outdoors. But there are certain areas where the ticks can be found. And so these black-legged ticks are found primarily in wooded areas, tall grasses, leaf litter. And they can't fly. That's important to know. But they can climb up onto vegetation and attach to hosts as, they, as the hosts pass by. So people that tend to get exposed would be people that are in the outdoors, like hikers, bird watchers, dog walkers, hunters. And I showed a picture in the upper right-hand corner of a tick that is extending its front legs. And this is a behavior called questing, where the ticks will hang out on the vegetation, wait for an animal or a human to walk by, and then grab onto their clothing. And then they will look for an area of exposed skin and insert their mouth parts and bite and take a blood meal. And at the same time, potentially inject organisms that cause disease, such as Borrelia burgdorferi. So in addition to Borrelia burgdorferi, it's important to mention there are other organisms contained within the body of the tick, and those can also be transmitted to us. Some are bacteria, some are viruses, some are parasites. So in the black-legged tick, we have Anaplasma phagocytophilum, found in 3 to 12 percent of ticks in endemic areas, Borrelia miyamotoi, one of those relapsing fever Borrelia, and then a virus, Poisson or deer tick virus. And then there's other things, such as Babesia microti. And so a list of organisms. The bottom line here is that a single tick bite can result in multiple infections. So prevention of tick bites is key. Now, what happens if someone gets Lyme disease? Usually the first thing they notice is the localized stage, which is a rash we call erythema migrans. It's seen in 
70 to 80 percent of infected individuals. So that does mean that 20 to 30 percent of individuals won't have a rash at all. And this rash is shown by these two pictures here, and it is often described as targetoid or like a bullseye rash. And you can see where it would get the name bullseye because it has a red center with an external clearing and then another red line. So it looks like a big target or a big bullseye. So this erythema migrans rash is very classic. If this is seen, this is diagnostic of Lyme disease in an endemic setting, and physicians will treat based on this. No laboratory testing is necessary. Now these patients may have other symptoms, or all they may have is this rash. And this rash could be easily overlooked if it's someplace not easily seen, such as the back or the scalp. Other symptoms these patients may have, though, include a flu, uh, flu-like syndrome with malaise, headache, and fever, and possibly lymphadenopathy. Now, if disease is not caught at this point, it will progress in most patients. And it will progress to what we call an early disseminated stage, days to weeks after that tick bite. That could result in more erythema migrans lesions, so more of those targetoid rashes. It can cause Bell's palsy, which is a paralysis on one side of the face, usually temporary but can last for quite some time. It can also cause more serious manifestations, such as meningitis, encephalitis, and even fatal arrhythmias, myocarditis, and pericarditis. So early recognition and treatment is key. You do not want to get into this stage with disease progression. Now, if Lyme disease is not treated at this point, it will continue to progress, and this is the late disseminated stage. This happens months to years after the tick bite. The most common symptom at this stage is arthritis. It's intermittent, and it usually is uh, unilateral, um, can be bilateral, and it causes severe joint pain and swelling of large joints, especially the knees, as is shown in this picture here by the CDC. Other important complications could be neurologic symptoms, numbness, tingling in the hands and feet, difficulty with short-term memory. These individuals have a hard time focusing and uh, being functional in their jobs. And then some of the species, especially those found in Europe, have some unique manifestations. Borrelia grinii is more likely to have neurologic manifestations, where Borrelia afzelii has a unique skin condition called acrodermatitis chronica atrophicans. So clearly we want to recognize and treat the Lyme disease early on and avoid these symptoms. Now treatment, early disease with erythema migrans is usually treated with doxycycline or another antibiotic for 14 to 21 days. The later stages are often more aggressively treated with intravenous antibiotics such as ceftriaxone. The problem comes in with this syndrome, which is called post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome. This is lingering symptoms after what is considered to be adequate treatment. This is seen in 10 to 20% of individuals, and they will persist with myalgias, arthralgias, cognitive defects, sleep disturbance, fatigue. We don't entirely know the cause. Uh, it's postulated that it may be an autoimmune response to the organism, and so the organism is not thought to still be present. There's no evidence at this point that this is an ongoing infection, but instead it's of the body's, it's the host response to the previous infection. So this is a very challenging area for treatment. Diagnosis, if it is not in that early stage with that classic rash, if that is not present, then the classic recommended therapy recommended by the CDC is this two-tiered serology testing algorithm. And essentially, as you can see here on the screen, this starts with an ELISA, so an enzyme-linked uh, immunosorbent assay testing for antibodies to Lyme disease. And if it is positive or equivocal, then we perform a confirmatory immunoblot looking for antibodies in IgM and IgG class. And it depends on the timing and how strong the diagnosis is suspected as to whether additional samples are tested and how the uh, diagnosis is made. So this is fine, and it, it has some problems uh, in challenges related to the fact that it's serology in and of itself, and antibodies aren't often detectable in the first week of illness. Um, but it is a good standard method for diagnosis. But 
because it's not perfect, we've been looking for other ways to diagnose Lyme disease. And at this point, molecular detection comes in as a possible adjunctive or even alternate test. So molecular detection allows for direct detection of the organism's nucleic acid. <clears throat> so whether that's DNA or RNA, you're detecting the organism directly or a piece of the organism rather than the patient's host response. Now, it tends to be positive earlier on before serology. And again, the development of antibodies can take two to three weeks. Uh, there are a variety of nucleic acid amplification tests, or NATs, that have been described. Unfortunately, um, none of them are currently FDA approved. So instead, these are laboratory developed tests. They aren't easily available in kits for other people to use. So there's limited availability, usually at specialized reference centers. Most of them use polymerase chain reaction, or PCR. And common targets are listed here, the 16S rRNA gene, flagellin gene, OSP-A, OSP-C, looking for an amplicon size of about 100 to 300 base pairs. And these are performed on a number of different specimen types, synovial fluid, synovium, skin biopsies, uh, cerebral spinal fluid, and whole blood. Now let's talk a little bit about PCR, and specifically real-time PCR, because this is the most common method that is used for detection of Lyme disease. So as most of you probably know, fluorescent probes are used to detect the DNA, and the DNA is detected as it is amplified, unlike conventional PCR where you don't detect the DNA until the whole reaction is finished. And so this can be very sensitive and specific if designed correctly. And it can be semi-quantitative because uh, the sooner the amplicon is detected, uh, the higher the amount of DNA that's present in the patient's specimen. If you want to do absolute quantification, that can also be done with an addition of a calibration curve, although that's not routinely done for clinical diagnostics. So usually real-time PCR semi-quantitative detection is used. Now, in my laboratory, we use a method called melting curve analysis, which is a, a modification of real-time PCR. It occurs after amplification. It can use nonspecific DNA binding dyes or specific probes. We prefer specific probes because it's more specific. And it has the additional benefit of detecting mutations or possibly even new organisms. So on this next slide here, I have an example of the assay that we use in my laboratory. This is our Lyme disease PCR. It detects all of the members of the Borrelia burgdorferi sensu latu complex. It targets the plasminogen binding protein, OPA1, and um, it uses FRET probes, fluorescent resonance energy transfer probes, for a melting temperature analysis stage after DNA has been amplified. And we use differences in the probe region in fact, there are two base pair differences to be able to distinguish Borrelia burgdorferi from Borrelia abzellii and Borrelia grinii. And this base pair difference shows up on a melting temperature analysis as two separate melting peaks. So this is a method that some laboratories use. We use it in my laboratory. And it's nice because you can use a single probe and primer set and be able to detect and differentiate related organisms. Now, what are the disadvantages of PCR? Why are we still using serology if we have PCR for early and sensitive detection? Well, the problem is, is even though the test can be sensitive, it is not sensitive in the specific specimens, in the host. It has a low sensitivity, I should say a clinical sensitivity, for detecting acute infection. And that's just because there's not a lot of DNA present in specimens that we test, such as whole blood. So for example, blood is only positive in about 50% of cases of patients with an erythema migrans rash. So what we would say, what we would consider to be confirmed acute Lyme disease, these patients have the erythema migrans rash, and yet blood is only positive in half of those. So that's not a very good test performance. Also, cerebral spinal fluid is positive in only about a third of patients with confirmed early infection, neuroborreliosis, or Lyme disease involving the central nervous system. It also doesn't distinguish between live and dead organisms. And we know that dead organisms can remain, especially in confined spaces like the joint space. 
So uh, there have been studies showing DNA persists after successful treatment in the joint space up to six months. Um, and the persistence does not correlate with duration of symptoms or risk of relapse in Lyme arthritis. So you can detect DNA in a Lyme uh, a patient infected with Lyme disease in joint fluid, so synovial fluid, and that doesn't necessarily mean the patient is still infected. The patient could be successfully treated. So these are limitations of Lyme disease PCR. And therefore, the way we use it is really as an adjunctive test, not routinely as a part of Lyme disease diagnosis. It's good for confirming infection when you have atypical clinical manifestations. And the primary specimen types that are tested are skin biopsies and synovial fluid or synovium tissue. And in these specimens, PCR actually has a relatively good sensitivity, greater than 90% on synovial fluid if patients have untreated or partially treated Lyme disease, and also quite good in uh, skin lesions from an erythema migrans. The sensitivity is anywhere between 36 to 88%. Now, we're talking single-plex PCR, where you're looking for a single organism. But remember, I said that those ticks can be infected with multiple organisms, and they can transmit them to humans. So it would be preferable if we could detect all the things that a person could get from a single tick bite. So multiplex molecular panels, these are on the market already, where you have multiple primers, sometimes probes, depending on the system, for detection of a number of organisms that share a common clinical presentation or a common exposure risk. So there are already tests that are approved or cleared by the Food and Drug Administration for uh, gastrointestinal disease, meningitis, encephalitis, positive blood cultures, and respiratory pathogens. Now at this point, there are not any panels for tick-borne disease available commercially, but there are some under development. So I think in the next five years or so, we will expect to see commercially available FDA approved or cleared tests that are panel-borne tests for uh, tick-borne diseases. Now the problem, of course, you're still using specific primers and probes, so you're only going to detect the organisms you're, you're targeting, and non-targeted organisms will be missed. So taking a step beyond this, this is partially overcome by use of broad range sequencing. And this is where you sequence a specific gene that will cover a range of organisms. So for example, the 16S rRNA gene is common to most bacteria. And so if you amplify that gene and then sequence it to uh, detect what is present, I apologize for this. And so if you then, to sequence what you've amplified, then you can use this to detect a number of different organisms and then say what they are. And you're not using, um, you're not going to miss organisms that have the 16S rRNA gene. So this is a promising approach that is one step beyond multiplex molecular tests. Now the next I will mention that I'm particularly excited about is metagenomic testing. This takes it even beyond one step of a targeted gene amplification and sequencing. With metagenomics, you are amplifying all of the nucleic acid in a specimen. And that could be bacterial, fungal, viral, parasitic, and of course human DNA will be in there as well. And that's important for tick-borne diseases because you have Lyme disease, which is, trans, which is a, a bacterium, Borrelia burgdorferi, that causes that disease. But then you have viral pathogens, also transmitted by ticks, and you have parasitic pathogens. So with metagenomic analysis, you could potentially detect all of those. Now at this point, because there's so much RNA and DNA, extensive pre- and post-processing steps are used to select for your targets of interest and remove non-relevant nucleic acid. And the bioinformatics of this is quite uh, complex, and therefore this is currently very expensive and time consuming. But I think this is bound to change in the future, and we're going to see potentially in the next five or 10 years diagnostic assays used to detect tick-borne diseases and other syndromes. Now I'm going to shift gears and talk about a specific case study where we used our FRET-based assay with melting temperature analysis 
to detect a new cause of Lyme disease, which we have called Borrelia maoneyi. And this is a novel cause of Lyme disease in the United States. Now, I'm going to tell you the story. And to do that, I have to set the national stage. And so uh, note Minnesota and Wisconsin are highlighted in red in the upper Midwest. And the story began in June of 2013 with a little boy who was from the northwestern part of Minnesota, as shown by the yellow star on this map. He presented with fever, headache, neck pain, myalgia, nausea and vomiting. He also had a diffuse rash and profound somnolence, so inability to easily be roused. He was very, very sleepy, so much that his parents brought him to the emergency room, and he was actually admitted to the hospital because of his profound somnolence and the syndrome with other symptoms. Now, he had spent the week prior in Spooner, Wisconsin, which is shown by this other gold star on the map, right over next in the state next door. And this is a picture of the little boy in his hospital bed. And it's just to illustrate the rash, which you can see is not that bullseye rash that I showed you earlier, but instead what we would describe as a macular papular rash, which is diffuse, variably sized, and involves his trunk and his extremities. Interestingly, it also involved his palms and soles. So not a classic Lyme disease presentation. This was the summertime, and so they tried to do a broad workup in this little boy. And one of the things that was ordered was our Lyme disease PCR. And this was ordered on a whole blood specimen. Now remember I told you before that whole blood is not a very sensitive specimen to test for detecting Lyme disease. Well, in this case, it's a good thing they ordered it because instead of seeing a melting temperature peak for one of the known pathogens, Borrelia afzelii, Gorinii, or Burgdorferi, we instead saw this peak in the middle. This was our patient result. So it was a clear positive, it was reproducible, and yet it clearly fell outside of the range of the known organisms that our assay looks for. But because this test detects all the members of the Borrelia burgdorferi sensu latu complex. We were pretty sure that this was a member of the complex. It just wasn't a member that we were familiar with. Now, this patient did eventually recover. He was hospitalized for a total of four days. He was treated with antibiotics and thankfully made a full recovery. So as we were investigating this, he got better and was released, but meanwhile, we started seeing additional cases. So this was just not a one-off case. In fact, we had another PCR positive in whole blood with this same atypical melting temperature peak in an 11-year-old male from Wisconsin. And this was just the following month. So this prompted us to do a retrospective review of our previous positives. Maybe we had missed some of these. They would have been reported out as a positive result, and we would have called it an atypical positive result. But now that we knew what to look for with this melting temperature peak right in the middle between the two other peaks, we could go back to our previous PCR runs and see if we had seen this before. Well, sure enough, our retrospective review showed that the year prior, we had a 65-year-old male from North Dakota, although he had likely tick exposure in Minnesota, and he also had the same peak. And this was all detected in whole blood. We then reached out to our colleagues, our sister labs throughout Minnesota and Wisconsin that are also performing this assay. And sure enough, Mayo Clinic Eau Claire reported detecting the same atypical peak in a synovial fluid specimen. And this was a 21-year-old woman from Wisconsin. And this was in that same month of June 2013 when this all started. So we had four patients. And then over the next month, we detected an additional two patients. So at this point, we were getting pretty excited. So I'm going to talk about the molecular workup of how you investigate a new species uh, once you've detected something. And one of the first things we did is we sequenced it. We sequenced our plasminogen binding protein gene. Um, and then we also sequenced the 16S rRNA gene. And the 16S rRNA gene sequence is shown here with the phylogenetic tree. And patient five and six are highlighted with the red arrow. Now I just want to point out that the red box shows Borrelia burgdorferi, the known cause of Lyme disease in the United States. And you can see that 
the DNA detected in patients five and six are clearly different than Borrelia burgdorferi with a good separation between them. So we were pretty sure that this was not our standard Borrelia burgdorferi. So at this point, we were communicating with our Minnesota Dep Department of Health and our Wisconsin Department of Health. We also reached out for assistance to our colleagues at the CDC in Fort Collins, Colorado. And a full investigation was undertaken. We had blood that we obtained from two patients. We sent that for culture of the organism. We also did sequencing, both at the CDC and at Mayo Clinic. And so here are some of our results. First of all, it was very exciting to see that on dark field microscopy, we could see spirochetes swimming in the blood of our infected patients. And we could quantitate them. It was about 85,000 spirochetes per milliliter of blood. Again, this is very unusual because, as, as I had mentioned earlier, Lyme disease is not usually detectable by blood because Borrelia burgdorferi is not present in any significant number. And spirochetes of Borrelia burgdorferi have never been detected by dark field microscopy. So being able to actually see them was very exciting and very unusual. We also were able to grow them in a culture using modified BSK media, and we saw modal spirochetes. We were able to propagate those spirochetes. So we're starting to fulfill some of Koch's postulates on uh, implicating this as the cause of the patient's symptoms. Um, and lastly, we did multi-locus sequence analysis. And this is a form of amplification where you amplify multiple genes, and then uh, through this analysis, you can compare to other Borrelia burgdorferi sensu latu genospecies and see how similar your organism is to known organisms. So this was previously used for defining Borrelia burgdorferi sensu latu genospecies. And I put the reference for you at the bottom of the screen. Now, the highest similarity was to Borrelia burgdorferi, but the cutoff for se separating genospecies is anything less than 98.3%. So at the closest pairwise similarity, we were at about 95%, so clearly less than 98%, and this confirmed that this was a novel Borrelia burgdorferi sensu latu genospecies. We proposed the name Borrelia mayonii after the name of the Mayo brothers who found it Mayo Clinic. And this name has now been accepted formally. So let's look at a breakdown of all the patients that we've tested to date since we've been performing our real-time PCR assay for Lyme disease since 2003. We've tested a lot of specimens. And at Mayo Clinic, we are an international reference laboratory, so we test patient specimens from all over the United States. So between 2003 and 2014, we tested over 100,000 patient specimens. Now let's break them down by time frame. So if we look at anything before 2012, from 2003 to 2011, we tested over 66,000 patient specimens, and none of them detected Borrelia mayonii. And so you can see uh, no Borrelia mayonii positives, and that was reflected by uh, the lack of us seeing any of these atypical melting peaks as shown in the upper right-hand corner. And we didn't go back and retest specimens. This was just analyzing previous runs from all of these other years. Now let's look at the right-hand column from 2012 when we first detected that first case up until September 2014, which is when we concluded our investigation. We had tested nearly 34,000 patient specimens during that two-year time frame, and we only detected six cases from patients that were residents of Minnesota, Wisconsin, or North Dakota. Now, patients from 44 other states, other than Minnesota, Wisconsin, and North Dakota, did not yield any Borrelia mayonii positives. So how did we interpret this? Well, it looks like Borrelia mayonii is only found in the upper Midwest, and it was not detected in our laboratory prior to 2012. And perhaps it just wasn't at levels that were high enough for us to be detecting it. Um, it could have still been in the wild, but as a human disease, it looks like it's newly emergent, and it looks like it's geographically confined to the upper Midwest. 
And what did we see with these six patients? Well, they had a, a span of ages, anywhere from 10 to 67 years. The majority were males, and that reflects what we usually see with Lyme disease, probably because males are more likely to be outside and exposed to tick bites. 5% with an acute febrile illness, and interestingly, three had potential neurologic involvement. That included confused speech, profound somnolence, visual difficulties, and this is unusual for Lyme disease early on. This was a bit uh, concerning that 50% of our patients had this potential complication. Four patients had a rash, but unlike that erythema migrans rash that I had described to you before, Actually, most patients had an atypical rash, like our young boy, our first patient. In fact, only one patient had a rash that could be called definitively an erythema migrans rash. And that is important to note because physicians use that rash to diagnose early Lyme disease and then prescribe antibiotics. Now, we did have one patient who had arthralgia, so joint involvement was seen with this organism infection. And all of our patients reported exposure to ticks or tick habitat. Five recovered with antibiotics, but our one patient with arthralgia continued to have joint pain after our two years of follow-up. Now, serologic testing was done on these patients. And as I mentioned earlier, this is considered the gold standard preferred diagnostic for Lyme disease. And how did it do? Well, it seemed to be performing as expected. So for example, patient number one, when we collected serum six days after illness onset, you can see that the EIA for C6 was positive, and the confirmatory immunoblot was positive for IgM. So this would be considered a positive result. But as I mentioned, the limitations with serology is that it takes a few days to develop a detectable immune response. So let's look at patient number three. The first specimen we had from patient number three was, detected, was collected only two days after illness onset, and that was essentially a negative result. But the next specimen we collected from patient number three was 29 days after illness onset, and that was now positive. So patients are developing an immune response, but as we know with serology, it's not going to be detectable early on. And so I have all of the patients here. We were able to have serologic tests performed on all of our patients except for one. Now we also did some additional testing looking for a vector. This is not something we normally do in a clinical laboratory. We don't usually go out and test ticks for tick-borne pathogens, uh, but in this case, we wanted to know, was it indeed the black-legged tick, Ixodi scapularis, that was transmitting Borrelia maonii? So we teamed up with some partners in Wisconsin, and here are a couple of the colleagues. Uh, they are looking at a white sheet that they have dragged over vegetation. The ticks, as I mentioned, will climb up onto vegetation and extend their legs, and then they will grab on as objects walk by or move by. And in this case, they grab onto a white sheet. That white sheet is then carefully examined, and ticks are removed, they're identified, put into vials, and then brought back to the laboratory. In this case, we brought them back to my laboratory, and we performed a very simple physical disruption of the tick. We did this with a scalpel blade. You can also do this with beads, through bead beading. And we tested each tick individually, but you can also test ticks in pools, pools of five, pools of 10. We wanted to get down to the individual tick level at this case. After we uh, chopped them up, we digested them with protonase K, then we extracted the DNA and performed our PCR assay as if it was a normal clinical specimen. And what did we find? Well, this, these are the results of our PCR testing of ticks that we had collected prospectively, as well as some archived specimens. And the map in the upper right-hand corner shows the area where we collected these ticks from. And I will highlight the main results here. So Borrelia maonii, out of the adult Ixodes scapularis that we tested, approximately 3% were positive for Borrelia maonii. Now I want to compare that to the column right next to it where Borrelia burgdorferi was detected in 34% of our adult Ixodes scapularis. 
So 3% versus 34%. Clearly Borrelia burgdorferi is the pathogen that you want to watch out for here. But Borrelia maonii is also present. And then we tested nymphal ticks and that was at, detected in 2.1%. So all in all, we had an overall detection rate of 2.9% of our Exodes ticks that we tested. So the major findings and conclusions from this analysis, largely which was performed using molecular techniques, are, sh are shown on the subsequent slides. So first feature, uh, number one, that I would consider to be a re remarkable feature, is that Borrelia maonii causes Lyme disease in the upper Midwest. And this map, with all the blue dots on it, shows all of the sites of different laboratories that send specimens to my lab for testing. And you can see that we are very well represented in the Northeast. We have a lot of laboratories that send specimens to us. And out of nearly 25,000 specimens, just within that two-year time frame that were from all of these other sites, uh, we did not detect Borrelia maonii. So we think that this really is geographically isolated or limited to the upper Midwest. Remarkable feature number two, patients with Borrelia maonii infection have, to date, had more severe disease than Lyme disease caused by Borrelia burgdorferi. We had potential neurologic involvement in three patients, illness requiring hospitalization in two of our patients, and interestingly, nausea and vomiting were common symptoms, and that's not typically seen in Lyme disease. I believe we will need further studies to really better define the spectrum of illness in patients infected with Borrelia maonii. It could be that we're just detecting the most severe cases and that there are many more cases of mild disease that are going unnoticed and undiagnosed. Uh, remarkable feature number three, the rashes, as I had explained, were more diffuse, with only one patient having a classic erythema migrans lesion. <clears throat> and again, this is important because physicians are using the rash as a diagnostic feature. So physicians have to be aware that with Borrelia maonii, the rash may look different. Remarkable feature, feature number four, it has been found predominantly in whole blood, which as I mentioned earlier, is not common for Borrelia burgdorferi. But we now think that PCR on whole blood may be the preferred method for detecting Borrelia maonii. And that's a paradigm shift for this organism. And as I mentioned, historically, less than 0.1% of blood specimens have been positive for Borrelia burgdorferi. And that's probably different for Borrelia maonii. So if you want to read the details of our study, they were published in the Lancet Infectious Diseases, and I want to give credit to all of the other individuals that are listed here. This was a multi-site collaboration with our uh, state universities, local state health departments, and the CDC. We've since published additional papers, and you may be interested in some of them here. The first paper was published in the International Journal of Systematic and Evolutionary Microbiology. That is how we confirmed the name Borrelia maonii, so this is now an accepted name. And then we also published the whole genome sequence and comparative genomics uh, in PLOS One in 2016. So with that, I'd like to conclude with this last slide that just acknowledges that this was a tremendous team effort with many, many individuals. And so I was very honored to be a part of that. And this was all using molecular diagnostics for Lyme disease. So it was a very exciting adventure. So with that, I would like to turn this back over to our hosts, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much for your presentation, Dr. Pritt. We do want to get right into the questions and input. So here's a reminder as to how audience members can communicate with us. Questions can be submitted via the Q&A button at that lower left. If we are unable to get to your questions due to time constraints, Dr. Pritt will be answering submitted questions via email. So let's begin with our first question. Dr. Pritt, an audience member would like to know, what are the best measures for preventing tick bites? Oh, that's a great question because you're probably, after watching this presentation, uh, worried about even going outside. Um, ticks are around us in many parts of the country. So the best thing is to take some simple preventative measures. As I mentioned early on, ticks are found in tall, uh, tall shrubs and bushes and grasses and in the leaf litter. 
So just taking simple steps such as avoiding the edges of a path. If you're going hiking, stay to the middle of the path and avoid the tall grasses where the ticks may be. Now, of course, that's not always feasible. Sometimes you just want to go out into the great outdoors and walk through the woods and, and the grasses. So in that case, you want to wear a tick repellent, such as DEET, and you'd spray that on exposed skin. You can also use permethrin on your clothing. And then, weather permitting, you can also just give the ticks less skin that they could potentially grab onto by wearing long sleeve shirts and long pants and by tucking your pants into your socks and, uh, um, and wearing a hat. And all of these, again, this clothing can be treated with permethrin. So those are just some simple steps to avoid tick bite. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, a, a little bit of a similar question. Another person wants to know, what should I do if I find a tick on myself? Oh yeah, that's a, that's a great question as well. And I should have mentioned earlier that um, one of the most important things you can do when you come in from being outdoors is to do a tick check. And when you do that tick check, you want to carefully check your whole body, including your scalp, and you want to check your children and your pets and your other friends and uh, family members for ticks. And you may come across a tick that is crawling on you in which case you can just grab it and flush it down the toilet. Uh, but if it's embedded in you, then you're going to want to remove it. And you're going to want to remove it as quickly as possible. The longer the tick is attached, the greater the likelihood it can transmit disease-causing organisms. The best way to remove it is to use fine tip tweezers. Just grab the tick by the base as close to the skin as you can and pull it out in a single continuous motion. You don't want to twist the tick. You don't want to squash the tick. Um, you don't want to damage yourself or the tick because that may increase the risk of infection. And so some of you may have heard of some home remedies like using a matchstick to burn the tick. Um, yes, that will work, but it may also increase the risk of infection, and you may also hurt yourself at the same time. Uh, petroleum jelly also works. But again, the goal is to remove the tick as quickly as possible. So you want to avoid things that take a while. You just want to take the tick off of you and remove it intact. Wonderful. We have some incredible questions coming in. Um, here's one. Do I always need to see a doctor when I find a tick attacked, uh, I'm sorry, attached to myself? Mm. Yeah, that's important, especially if you live in an area with a lot of ticks. You'd be going to the doctor all the time, <laughs> although hopefully you're taking those preventative measures I mentioned and not getting ticks on you. But if you do get a tick on you and it's been attached, you don't necessarily need to go to the doctor. But here's a few general guidelines. If the tick has been attached for more than 36 hours, and you may be able to tell that just by how swollen or engorged the tick is. If it's very engorged, that means it's probably been attached for 36 hours. Then I would say yes, if you live in an area with a lot of Lyme disease, you should remove the tick, put it in a Ziploc or plastic bag, and then go to your physician and tell them you found this tick. If the tick ends up being a black-legged tick, then you are at risk for having Lyme disease, and your physician may give you an antibiotic, such as doxycycline, to prevent Lyme disease. Now, if the tick doesn't look like it's swollen and you think it's only been attached for a short period of time, then the recommendations are to remove the tick. You can keep it in a plastic bag or you could flush it down the toilet. Um, you want to wash the area carefully, wash your hands, and then you're just going to want to watch that area. Look for a rash and watch for other symptoms of tick-borne diseases such as fever, myalgias, swollen lymph nodes. And if you see any of those symptoms, then you should go to the doctor. You can bring the tick with you, and you can tell them that you did have this tick bite. But you don't necessarily have to go to the doctor each time you have a tick bite. Wow, this is so interesting. Um, we have one uh, question, time for one more question. Are there any molecular Lyme disease tests in the pipeline that would be FDA approved? Yeah, that would, uh, that's a great question. And <clears throat> fortunately, the answer is yes. There are many tests that are in the pipeline. 
I don't know if any of them will go all the way through to FDA clearance or approval for in vitro diagnostic use, but that is the goal. And so I know of several companies working on tests using PCR and also additional technologies besides polymerase chain reaction. And those have shown promise for maybe being more sensitive. And so I think it would be great to have a, a more sensitive molecular diagnostic test, especially for that early stage, that first week of illness, when antibodies aren't necessarily detectable, that you can have sensitive and specific detection of Borrelia burgdorferi and other related organisms causing Lyme. So I think we should all keep a close eye on the market and talk to some of our vendor colleagues and find out what they're working on and maybe even partner with them to help them develop their tests because I think there really is a need for it and I'm, I'm very hopeful that in the next five years we'll see some tests on the market. That would be great. Thank yeah. you again, Dr. Britt. Um, this has been an amazing presentation. I, um, do you have any final comments before we end this presentation? No, I just, uh, you know, it's spring now, so everyone go out, enjoy the outdoors, but uh, also take those measures to avoid tick bites. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Pritt. I'd like to thank LabRoots for making today's educational webcast possible. Today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewings through July 2017. Keep an eye out for an email from LabRoots alerting you when this webcast will be available for replay. We also want to encourage you to forward that announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Thank you again for joining us, and we hope to see you next time. Goodbye.